This video is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Underdog Fantasy is the best and easiest place to play fantasy sports. With daily and season-long contests, Underdog Fantasy gives you more ways to win than anyone else. Sign up today using promo code TSU to claim your special pick, plus a first-time deposit offer up to $250 in bonus cash. It's Underdog Fantasy, the best way to fantasy. For, for us, we do draft uh Draft projection rankings. That's what Rivals, that's what On3, that's what ESPN does. All the recruiting rankings are draft projection rankings, and most people don't even understand that. They think we're just ranking the top player in you know the state or the country. No, we're ranking who we think will be the top draft prospect. That's why a quarterback, offensive tackle, edge rusher, or safety, linebacker, receiver, whatever, is always the number one player, and that's why running backs are very rarely ever five stars. So, um, yeah. But, and also another thing that's important, to, uh, to remember, our scouting team follows draft trends. For example, there hasn't been an offensive tackle selected in the first round of the NFL draft with less than a 34 inch wingspan or 34 inch arms since I believe 2011 or something like that. So, that being said, we haven't had a five star offensive tackle's arms that are less than 34 as a five star. So, um, it, it has a lot to do with the draft. So, I say all this to say, it is absolutely impossible to predict kids at right after they finish their freshman year where they'd be drafted. So a lot of these rankings are going to change. It, it happens every year. There'll be a kid who debuts as a top 100 prospect and ends up somewhere as like an 86 three star. And he's at SMU after he took off super early on stuff like that will happen. It's okay. Everyone's path and journey is different. And these are just the 13 kids that have caught our eye the most now. There's going to be hundreds of other kids that emerge and are going to be ranked ahead of these kids. That's just how it works. Everyone's journey and developmental process is different than others. But our number one prospect in the state for 2027 is Ethan Feaster. Uh, he goes by Booby. He's been around forever. I've been hearing about this kid since he was in middle school. Um, he's in seventh grade middle school because he entered high school holding over two dozen offers. Um, for his first day of school, he already had two dozen offers when he showed up to DeSoto. Uh, originally from Louisiana, state of Louisiana, not sure when he moved over to DF Dub, uh, but is originally from Louisiana. Uh, in an in-depth story I did, kind of going through all these uh, the in-state 27 guys that got ranked, I wrote, uh, you know, I think it's far from over for him and his recruitment, but an early crystal ball prediction, if I had to put one in, it would definitely be for LSU, as I also think they've done the best job up to this point. Um, he also is really special because – uh, DeSoto has probably, I mean, in my opinion, one of, if not the best receiver coaches in all the state, um, blanking on his first name, but uh, it's Sweeney, Coach Sweeney. Uh, fun fact is also Ruben Owens' cousin. There was some buzz Ruben Owens is going to transfer to DeSoto for a little bit a couple years back. But anyways, I asked Coach Sweeney after I saw DeSoto beat Willis, and I think I told this story last week, after I saw DeSoto beat Willis at the Alamo Dome in the fourth round of the playoffs, I asked Sweeney, so you coached Jonte Cook for the four years he was in high school and knew him through middle school after the Soto Middle Schools. The same thing for Booby. Where do you think Booby lines up compared to where Jonte was at this stage at his age? And he like looked at me like I was crazy. And I was like, what? And he was like, it's Booby. It's not even close. Like he's that further ahead of Jonte, uh, at least where, where Jonte was as a freshman. And Jonte contributed to the Soto as a freshman, but he didn't start. Feaster started every single game for DeSoto last year and finished third in receptions uh, behind a kid who – or third in receptions, reception yards, reception touchdowns behind uh, a kid who was a senior who ended up in New Mexico State and another kid who was a four-star SMU commit. He has one more year of high school, Dalen Singleton. So a lot to like about Feaster. Um, also, there is a ton of smoke. He's in a reclass to 2026. Uh, I know it's kind of a rumor, but when there's this much smoke, it happens 99% of the time. So – uh, something to remember is Feaster is most likely going to be a 26 recruit at some point or another. So keep that in mind. Um, another kid is Myson Johnson Cook, also at DeSoto. Uh, he checks in as our number 12 overall prospect in the state or in the country, uh, number two prospect in the state, and he's 6'1 and a half, 220. This is a kid who is at Illinois, uh, his fresh or he was in Illinois' freshman year. Played every position up there, was awesome. Got 10 offers just off of freshman film. Shows up at Katy High School in January after moving to Houston uh, and over Christmas break. When he <laughs> when he moves to Houston, 
over Christmas. I'm just going to pull this stuff up so y'all can kind of look at the visuals too, too or whatnot. When Mice and Johnson Cook moves to Houston, I see him in a training session after, uh, a couple weeks after. And I'm talking to him, and I'm like, Katie, huh, you going to play running back or linebacker for them or both ways because he, he went both ways at Illinois. And he was like, actually, uh, I'm probably transferring. And I was like, what, where? And he goes, uh, DeSoto or Duncanville, I have family up there. We're going to move up there sometime before the school year's over. And I was just like, okay. He's now at DeSoto. Um, he's going to play both running back and linebacker for him. This is in – I said what I said at the beginning of this segment about these players moving back in rankings because other guys usually end up emerging later that might you know, be a better prospect. This guy is going to stay in the same range for a long, long time. And I can tell you – Go ahead, Jeff. Would you like would you like a quick some quick Vince Young fun facts? Okay. Let's hear so, it. So this is this is based on uh about seven minutes of Google of running through the Google machine. Uh Vince's wife, based on one unreliable link I found, is five feet eight inches tall. Okay, okay, we can work with that. We can work with that. Uh Vince's son Jordan is an incoming freshman at Kincaid. Okay. So he would be class of 2028. Same class as Brad Smith's son. Ah, you know, and I, and, and I would, if anybody saw me kind of smirking uh, while I was looking at my phone, I did go to VY's Instagram to find the picture. And there are, uh, there are people having Arch Manning transfer debates in VY's Instagram feed about you know, when Vince is trying to post a picture of his son. So thank you to you degenerates out there who can't let it go for. Five minutes. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, but with Myson Johnson Cook, this is a guy who's going to stay at, at the top range for a long time. Uh, he's verified at 6'1 and a half, 220, and also at uh, the All 22 slash Elite 11 event in Austin earlier this year. Uh, he was timed running the two fastest 40 yard dash times of the day at 448 and 44, uh, 444. Laser verified. And keep in mind, he was the only kid there that was a 2027 besides Zayn Rowe, and he tested better than every other single kid there, and it was invite only. So, um, uh, Cameron uh, Govan, to answer your question, uh, Jordan, how come these guys don't have to sit out a year at the UIL looks at these transfers? Uh, for Mice and Johnson Cook, like he actually legitimately had family in Dallas. I think they, their plan was to move to Houston. They moved there, and were like, uh, we don't really like it here. Or maybe it isn't the best, you know, setting for him or whatnot, even though he's at Katie. And they moved to – they like, they actually have family. Most of the time, that's just an excuse people say. They actually got family up there and an address in uh, the DeSoto zone. Also, uh, another thing, Cameron, a lot of the, the South Dallas schools have open enrollment. And that means you don't have to live in the DeSoto school zone to go to DeSoto High School. You could live – like, if I had a high school kid as a son – he could live in Louisville in my apartment with me, and I could drive him to Soto every day, and he could legally go to school there and play football for them. Um, Westlake has the same thing. Uh, Duncanville, uh, South Oak Cliff, Lancaster, a lot of them have that same thing. And the, the way you have open enrollment and can go to the school without living in the school zone is you pay some fee at the beginning of the year that's like 50 bucks or something, and you just pay it every year at the beginning of the school year. Um, and that's how it works. So uh, – I believe that fee is only for the schools who have technical open enrollment. A school like Austin LBJ, they have open enrollment to some degree, but that's because they're an early college as well. Um, they have the early college, and if you're a school that has an early college or a similar program like that or kind of like what Maynard New Tech is as a school, you're able to have kids move in even if they don't live in the school zone because there's like the the education loophole, I guess. That's <laughs> how that's how Skyline – got really good exactly on samples because they had exactly there were all different kinds of clusters you like you, you know aviation or science or whatever and you could get guys in from an academic yeah. standpoint yeah but so myson johnson cook is he, he's gonna be a five-star by also. the way i just i just watched uh two of jordan young's uh highlights from his eighth grade year so jordan i've slipped to that level so just go ahead and just kick me in the nuts the next time you see me because I've officially watched an eighth grade highlight and I kind of hate myself right now. So no, you're you're good. Uh, this Myson Johnson Cook cat also he didn't run track last year because uh, he was in the process of moving. 
but as an eighth grader went 10, nine, seven in the 100 and 22, eight, three in the 200. Um, right now he's listed as a five-star athlete. Every single school is just recruiting him just to recruit him. They're not telling him a certain position yet. Right now he says he doesn't care. I'm telling you right now, he definitely likes running back more. Um, he's like every other kid. They want to score touchdowns. They like scoring touchdowns more than they like preventing them. Um, so, Likely going to end up one day as, as a five-star running back instead of five-star athlete. Jeff, oh, Jordan, shut, Jordan's, shut about, Jordan's about to get triggered. Jordan hey, just got triggered. Chill, Watch. He's, chill. He's I'm, not, I'm not looking at that. I ain't. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, no, so he's, he's going to be a, a kid we're talking about a lot these next few years. Uh, another one, we got another, uh, another legacy kid here. Jeff, for those, you might for like those this listening one. on audio. Jake Bayless is trying to he's trying to get Jordan to take the baby Gronk bait, and I don't think Jordan's gonna take it today. Yeah, so we got Colton Nussmeyer, <laughs> the younger brother of Garrett Nussmeyer, the son of Doug Nussmeyer. Hey, honestly, no joke. Colton Nussmeyer is a guy that depending on how he develops, I would watch him to be a potential quarterback target for Sark. Sark and Doug Nussmeyer, very, very good friends. So I would I would keep an eye on Colton Nussmeyer. Yeah, um, I wrote in the same story, if there's a 2027 in-state QB that is going to get recruited by Texas, it's probably this guy. Uh, he he checks the most boxes for what Sark usually looks for in a quarterback. And uh, J.W. Crunch, uh, Texas has not offered Myson Johnson Cook. They have offered Booby Feaster, though. Um, I do know Texas invited Myson Johnson Cook to come to an event this offseason in the summer. And he wasn't able to make it for whatever reason. So you have um, thoughts one way or the other, Jordan, on lefty quarterbacks? Uh, I myself don't. Uh, it is a little strange just looking at it and comparing them to right-handed quarterbacks. But I mean, I don't know. Um, one thing I can say, I've only seen baby nuts. That's kind of what we call them. I've only seen baby nuts throw in state seven on seven. Uh, but it was clear he can. He can throw outside the numbers, and you're probably like, well, shit, I hope so. He's the this ranked that high. Kids who are this young usually are not able to throw outside the numbers consistently at, at the the way he does. Uh, even Cade Klubnik. Cade Klubnik, by his senior year, I, I seriously thought Cade Klubnik was 1,000% a top five player in the country, or at least prospect in the country. He was that good as a senior. But his sophomore year, he couldn't consistently hit guys outside the numbers. He just couldn't. Um, but Nussmeyer, at least in the seven on seven settings throughout that tournament, he consistently was doing that. Uh, barely played as a freshman, only went 26 of 50 when he got in at you know random times on varsity. But this is going to be his first year starting on varsity uh, this fall. Uh, yes, LSU should be considered the early favorite considering his brother goes there. Um, also, another thing about Nussmeyer that really is off the charts for him. LSU has this annual camp they do that's really similar to the annual camp Texas does, uh, where LSU's camp is invite only. You're not there unless you have an invite, and you only have an invite if you're a dude that they're actually looking at recruiting, scouting, evaling. Besides Nussmeyer, there was a handful of other top 247 quarterbacks there, including uh, Bryce Underwood, who's our number one overall prospect in the 2025 class and is an LSU quarterback commit. And everyone we've talked to has said Nussmeyer was the best QB there, not named Bryce Underwood. And he was younger than every other kid there throwing uh, for LSU that day. So um, a lot to like. And then right here, if there's going to be an in-state 27 prospect lands and off from Sark, this should be the guy. And then mighty, but uh, pretty, pretty damn strong. Five foot seven, you're probably like, as it says, how could he be ranked that high? Well, he has production out the ass, and he's got the track times you look for. Yes, he's 5'7". Yes, he's 165. Um, but these are his cousins, James and Jaquiz Rogers. And one of them played in the NFL for eight years at 5'7". So uh, it, it can be done. That's why, you know, they feel good enough about throwing him up there. Uh, yes, is a little undersized. Is that something that kind of worries me long term? A little bit. But when you have 2,000 yards as a freshman in a 5A district, and I believe he played 12 games as a freshman, also in district overall MVP as a freshman, there's a lot to like there. So um, uh, other players who come to mind that a new one district MVP, overall MVP, not just offensive or defensive as a freshman, 
Uh, Terry Bussey is the only one I can think of. And he did it in 2A. He's playing in 5A. So uh, pretty impressive by uh, him. Cooper Witten, this has already gone viral several times this summer. This is Jaden Jason Witten's son. Uh, not much more we got to talk about. Had a really, really, really good freshman season. Yes, he's playing private school ball, so I'll probably hold that against him till the end of time. Um, but his dad's coaching him, so it's a cool story. His dad, Jason Witten, is the head coach over at uh, Argyle Liberty Christian. They won state this past year in football. They also won it in the 4 by one and 4 by 2 that he plays for. Um, I'm not sure if there is an early favorite for Cooper Witten. I actually know nothing about his recruitment besides the fact that he's picked up a few offers this summer after camping. He was at Texas on June 1st for the elite camp, um, but he showed up to Austin and left Austin without an offer. So, uh, yeah. thing with him, uh, he kind of has an interesting body type. It's very clear he's still growing. I know this isn't the best photo of him I have pulled up, uh, but there is a pretty decent high chance that he could grow into a linebacker prospect, uh, probably not going to be a safety long term. So, um, yeah, and then Weston Nielsen, I've actually talked about him a little bit on the show already in the past, uh, local kid at Bastrop, uh, number two QB in the state, number four quarterback overall in the country. Um, had a really interesting freshman year. Uh, I don't think he started the five games he played in, but he appeared in five games. They went three and two. His stats are on the screen. You can see that, obviously. Um, interesting recruitment. Oregon was his first offer. Oregon offered him out of nowhere. Uh, a lot of people found out – a lot of people in Austin didn't even know who he was and found out who he was after Oregon offered and wondered how could Oregon offer this kid that only appeared in five games on varsity as a quarterback, right? Well, Will Stein coached L.A. Travis with the head coach of Bastrop, Jake Greedle, who was the receivers coach at Lake Travis for – three, four-year period, and Coach Garrett Wilson also coached Hudson Card at receiver. His last year at Lake Travis was the last year Hudson Card played receiver. So um, long, long-term long connection there. Uh, Greedle called up Stein, said, hey, you need to look at this kid. Stein's like, all right, I'll look at him and loved what he saw. Uh, I do think that offer might have been a little too early, but you know it doesn't matter because he is an Oregon-level guy. Uh, if he's an Oregon-level guy, you might ask, is he a Texas-level guy? Oregon offers about 30 QBs a year. Texas offers about three. So um, an Oregon offer at that position means a little than it does at others. He also says A&M and a few others. I really like this kid. He is an elite Power 5 talent. He will play at an elite Power 5 school, maybe in the SEC potentially. Uh, but I don't think he's going to end up at Texas. Um, he doesn't have an offer. He's camped several times trying to get one and hasn't landed it. And at this point, I just – I don't – know how likely it is to expect that even as a local product and even as someone who could follow Diabella five star. So, um, yeah. And, the uh, CB to answer the, the level of play, it's just, there's the, the athletes in public school are better. Um, top to bottom, better athletes, sometimes better coaching as well. And, um, while private school can be more organized with certain things like, I just the the public school football games are more fun to cover, more fun to be around, and you know there's the the kids are playing for something more, you know, and um, especially certain parts of places you go to, the only way out is that that football and that gridiron. So you know they're playing harder than these private schools do, who are gonna go be something else. Which reminds.